Is that okay? Um, welcome everybody. Um, it's a real delight to be uh, chairing this fringe today. I'm Louise Hague. I know you're expecting Lisa Nandy, so apologies um, for that. But I'm uh, Labour's prospective parliamentary candidate in Sheffield Healy, and it's a particular privilege for me to be chairing today because um, I was actually involved with Lisa in setting up the all-party parliamentary group on international corporate responsibility and until about three or four years ago I helped coordinate it as well so you've got a fantastic panel here today to talk about the subject of business and human rights and I think you know it's, it's fantastic that you're all here today because in the wake of the financial crisis and with scandals like the Rana Plaza disaster and uh, going back further than that even scandals like the Danta and Trafigura, there aren't very many more important debates, I don't think, for us to have in the Labour Party about the role of corporates in all our lives. We see this at the moment with the negotiations over the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Um, and so, really grateful for the work that CORE do and that the APPG do as well on really pushing this agenda forward. So, we're going to start with, um, with Peter Frankenthal, who is the Economic Relations Programme Director at Amnesty UK and has been working on business and human rights for a number of years and is really at the forefront of this from the NGO side of the debate. So, Peter, over to you. Thank you very much, Louise. Good evening, everyone. And thank you to the Corporate Responsibility Coalition Corps for convening this event. Amnesty International and many other NGOs are part of Corps because we believe through the Core Coalition we can campaign and do our advocacy more effectively than if we're all working separately on corporate accountability issues. Um, the title is Labour Leadership in Business and Human Rights. I think the most important element of Labour Leadership is to have a vision of what business and human rights really means. What is responsible capitalism and what, what is a world like where companies respect human rights? Because if we don't get that vision from the leadership of the Labour Party, it's very difficult to imagine how Labour in office can help create a world in which businesses have more positive impacts on human rights. So that's the very first element of um, a vision. In pointing to a world where companies um, exist to serve the purposes of society um, rather than to maximise shareholder value in the short term, which is a widely perceived goal of companies, certainly um, in terms of companies' own thinking about their purpose and financial markets thinking about the purpose of companies, in trying to challenge this goal, the Labour Party would not be setting the cat amongst the pigeons because increasingly um, financial analysts and people from within the industry are trying to challenge the short-termism that makes it very difficult for companies to respect human rights and have positive impacts on the environment and on sustainable development. I was at a meeting at Cas Business School just a few days ago where financial journalists, financial analysts, commentators were saying that maximising short-term value does not serve the purposes of society and we need to look again at the very purpose of the corporation. Um, however, it's not enough just to have a vision of a world where companies respect human rights. A future Labour government will need to will the means to make this happen. And that means changing the ground rules by which companies do business. And when I say changing the ground rules, this would mean reviewing the duties of directors and reporting requirements in company law. It would mean re reviewing criminal law provisions against companies and why such provisions are very infrequently used. Let's take the example of Trafigura, a UK registered company who conspired in the UK to dump toxic waste in the Ivory Coast Toxic waste was dumped, leading to tens of thousands of people who suffered debilitating health effects. A dossier of evidence was presented to the Crown Prosecution Service. They said that it's not a matter for them, it's a matter for the police. The same dossier of evidence was presented to the police who said, don't come to us, go to the Environment Agency. And the Environment Agency said, it's not part of their remit. There needs to be a review of criminal laws applicable to companies. There needs to be 
a review of access to civil litigation, to civil remedies in the UK courts, in particular on the part of victims of UK corporations overseas. There needs to be a review of some of the legal protections that companies enjoy. In particular, a review of the balance between commercial confidentiality and public interest. This year is the 30th anniversary of the toxic gas leak in Bhopal. In the immediate aftermath of that toxic gas leak, around 15,000 people died and tens of thousands of people suffered long-term illness. The company concerned Union Carbide, a subsidiary of a US company, refused to give doctors the chemical composition of the toxic gas of the compound that had escaped. They said it was a trade secret. And I wonder if today, in similar circumstances, in India or in many other countries, companies wouldn't use commercial confidentiality in a way that is grossly detrimental to the protection of, of human rights. There also is a need, as part of looking at the ground rules of, um, under which companies operate, to look at rules of trade and investment, and to look at the ways in which those, those rules privilege companies. Louise mentioned the transatlantic trade and investment partnership. These kind of agreements often make it very difficult for states to intervene to hold companies accountable. Any steps that states do to intervene, even for the protection of human rights and the environment that affects the profitability of a project, could be used as a basis for the company to go to investor state um, dispute settlement, and that could lead to very, very large damages against the state. So it's really important that all international trade and investment agreements should be scrutinized um, by the government for their implications for human rights and for the ability of the government to intervene. Um, a clearly, there's a limit to what a future Labour government will be able to do unilaterally in terms of changing the ground rules. But governments always say that they want a level playing field when it comes to international standards, when it comes to business and human rights, when it comes to impacts on the environment. But when governments are in office, they seldom do a great deal to actually create such a level playing field. So it's really important that Labour, when in government in the future, should, should ensure that the UK's influence is used in all multilateral fora which can determine the ground rules by which companies operate. We're talking here about the UN system, we're talking about the OECD, which um, has developed guidelines for multinational enterprises, we're talking about international financial institutions such as the World Bank and the European Investment Bank, of which the UK is a shareholder and part of the governance that have performance standards for companies that they lend to. We're talking about WTO guidelines, the G8, the G20. Labour leadership on human rights means leadership in multilateral forum on this issue. A key indicator of labour leadership in business and human rights is the coherence of policies across government. What we've seen with the current government is that there are pockets of commitment. For example, a year, uh, a year ago, um, two secretaries of state, Cable and Haig, uh, launched, the first, uh, 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 launched the first national action plan of any state to give effect to the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. This was a considerable commitment, but little has been done over the last year to follow it up. It's very important that there should be coherence across government departments, but also that Downing Street and the Cabinet Office shouldn't act as a block when you have ministers that are prepared to take positive initiatives, which often happened. It happened under the previous Labour government, it's happened um, under the current coalition government. All too often, we've seen this, for example, with the modern um, day slavery bill. NGOs, including the core coalition, want to see a supply chain amendment to the bill requiring UK companies to root out, to say what measures they're adopting, to root out forms of modern day slavery from their supply chains. Many companies are supporting the idea of a supply chain transparency amendment to the slavery bill. Biz seem um, not to be opposing it at this point, likewise the Home Office. But we understand that Downing Street are vigorously opposed 
because of the red tape and regulatory burden it would impose on companies, despite the fact that many companies that have brands and reputations to protect do want to see um, a requirement to monitor their supply chains. And there is uh, slavery in the, in, in the UK across a number of industries, modern forms of slavery, hospitality industry, the care industry, um, construction, catering, fish and meat, um, uh, poultry processing. And the point here is that if you don't address the demand for abusive forms of labour, for modern forms of slavery and supply chains, it's always going to be lucrative for people to engage in human trafficking and bring people into this country as forced involuntary <coughs> labour. Um, finally, it's very important that a future Labour government should be prepared to follow up on measures to improve business impacts on human <coughs> rights, to evaluate the effectiveness of those measures, and to strengthen them if they're not effective. And in this respect, I think that there's a lot that the Labour Party can learn from the previous period of Labour office, from 97 <coughs> to 2010. There were some very promising initiatives, but these were fragmented, they were quite patchy, and they were not followed up. Um, apart from the most significant um, overall initiatives, the Human Rights Act and the Corporate Manslaughter Act, Stephen Timms in 2000, uh, when he was pensions um, minister, he um, announced uh, an amendment to the Pensions Act requiring occupational pensions in the UK to state whether their statement of investment principles required them to address human rights, environmental and ethical issues as part of their process of decision making. Now Steve will be in a much better position to tell whether this amendment had any effect. It was certainly intended to empower pension funds and their members vis-a-vis -vis the fund managers that manage those funds. My impression is that it didn't have the effect that was intended, but nothing more was done to follow up on this. Another example was in 2000, Stephen Byers announced a review of the mission and status of the UK Export Credits Guarantee Department. This resulted in a set of business principles requiring UK export finance to ensure that its activities were in keeping with international human rights and environmental standards. A business principle unit was set up within the Export Credit Guarantees Department to have oversight of these business principles. But one of the last acts of the Labour government in 2010 was to ditch the business principles and to disband the business principles unit. This was done because the British Exporters Association argued that these business principles were too onerous on UK companies seeking support from the Export Credit Guarantees Department. The lesson to be learned from this is, of course, Business associations will always be arguing against any forms of regulation. But the future Labour government has to look at these, look at, uh, look at their assertions critically. And in this particular case, is a six-page questionnaire requiring an exporter to detail the social and environmental impacts um, of the transaction that they want to receive public funding support from UK export finance is that really um, too onerous? So I think we're in a position now where there's a lot of opportunity, um, there's a lot to play for, but there's a long way to go before the Labour Party can exercise the kind of leadership that can give us the confidence to believe that a future Labour government will hold companies much more accountable for their global impacts on human rights. It's a very compelling narrative of the uh, scale of the problems, but also of the very many policy areas that this debate touches and the need for a coherent narrative and a vision from, uh, from the Labour Party. Um, speaking of which, now I'd like to move on to Richard Howitt, who is our MEP uh, for the East of England. He is the um, Special Rapporteur for CSR, have I got that right? Yes, good. Yes. <laughs> and uh, the Labour Spokesperson on Foreign Affairs in the European Parliament, and has been pushing this agenda for very many years in Europe. Um, including uh, many earlier interventions of the recently um, 
recently agreed on direct, uh, directive on corporate sustainability reporting. So uh, we owe him a great, uh, great deal of gratitude for, for his work there. So Richard, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, to Marilyn, to Peter, Stevie, to the all later, uh, I pay huge tribute to the work. And the work we do is a response to the work that you're doing. Uh, and I'm very pleased that when I was first working on this, now more than 10 years ago, there wasn't a European equivalent of the core coalition. And one of the things that you did was to get the European equivalent. And by having that, we're now in a position to have got some of the things that you're campaigning for, so thank you, and I'm very proud to be at your uh, fringe event. Uh, and for late party delegates who perhaps don't follow this in with all the same history that, uh, of some of us, um, although Peter is absolutely always right to challenge us, uh, he's a good friend, and if he didn't, I would be worried. Um, the 2006 companies out, that Margaret Hodge actually, to her great credit, was the final person who pushed that through, was one of the leading uh, examples of putting through corporate responsibility legislation in Europe uh, at the time, particularly in requiring supply chain responsibility. We were, we were the country to do that and to really forge the argument on saying companies couldn't just sell it's somebody else, it's not us, because it's down our supply chain somewhere. Uh, and Labour certainly shouldn't have abolished its commitment to what was called, I think, the Corporate Global Citizenship Union in the Foreign Office, I think was a mistake for example, uh, but we did some good things in office and we're here because we're going to do some good things in office next time, aren't we? Now, um, Kerry's here as well and we'll talk about that, so I want to say next a word about what we have done at the European level and you were kind enough to say that in 1999, which is so long ago, everyone can't remember, right, that was the first time that I put a resolution to the European Parliament saying that companies should, in their annual accounts under company law, report on their social and environmental impact. And we've got it through, and we've got it through three times since. And on each occasion, blood has been spilt, it's been so difficult to get through. Uh, uh, and on each occasion, the business lobby, uh, the mainstream business lobby, I should add, has said this is the most radical, awful, terrible thing that will bring uh, plagues of locusts and uh, monsoons and all the rest of it, and it shall never happen, right? Uh, and folks, we did it. We did it in April of this year. It was one of the three aims of the Core Coalition and its European equivalent. And for a whole range of factors that there isn't time to tell you about, but I'm ha I've written about it, you can read it, and so I'm happy to, to, to chat with you outside the meeting. But for a whole range of factors, what used to be radical and utopian and unaffordable and extreme and anti-business and all the rest of it, which it was never any of those things, right, is now a requirement for all listed businesses, 11,000 listed businesses, and something called public interest. You see, they're cheering me already. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could join in, right, you? 11,000, 11,000 big businesses across the whole of Europe required in their annual accounts to report on their impact on society, on the environment, and something that's changed since 1999, thanks to Peter and his colleagues, human rights, also anti-corruption, and also diversity policy. Uh, and it's not perfect, of course, and people can say it should be better, and so on, but it's a very, very serious commitment. It's got to be inside the annual accounts. Uh, people say it doesn't have to be audited, it does, partly have to be audited because the process by which it's done has to be audited. People say, well, it's compiler explains, so they might not do that, but the pension fund regulation Peter is talking about uh, did that, and most of them are doing it. Denmark did compiler explains, 96% are doing it. And in fact, if you ask the European Commission and look at their guidance, uh, uh, it's not compiler explains in the way, it's more complied than comply uh, or uh, explain, and uh, like Margaret Hodge and the Companies Act, it involves the supply chain, and that was one of the hardest things, by the way, to get through the European Parliament, but we did it. Uh, and uh, I have to say, um, you know, that all through the process, people have said to us, voluntary reporting is enough, they're all doing it, 100% of the top 100 on the FTSE in London do do it already, so they so say, this is unnecessary red tape, all the rest that we've just heard from Peter. But the truth is, 
that that 11,000 number is double the number of companies who currently report. So there is no doubt this is a major, major step forward. And it wouldn't have been done without all of you, and it wouldn't have been done without all of you, and it probably wouldn't have been done without Labour Party and the Labour MP as well. So forgive me if we take a bit of pleasure uh, in all of that. Uh, but if the next step is implementation. These things are only good, as good as how far uh, they are implemented. And some things probably Steve will talk about in terms of corporate governance are very important parts of that, but I suspect he's going to talk about that, so I don't want to add, it, add to it. And I hope he's going to, you're going to talk about the SDGs, are you? Yeah, so I won't talk about that, but one of the next steps is taking that from the European level and taking it into the global level. And I'm working with Steve and his coalition to help deliver that and try and, crucially, to help deliver European support for that. But because he's going to talk about that, I'll pass over that in terms of of my contribution. So what about the next thing, right? Because that's one huge thing that you never sit back and there's a lot of human rights abuses in the world and there's a lot of corporate publicity in it and we need to do more to stop that. And the best companies want to do that. I should, we should always say this is not an anti-corporate or anti-business agenda. It's about saying that businesses who do the right thing shouldn't be undermined by the businesses who don't do the right thing. So the next step, the SDG, Steve is going to talk about that, but I will just say that the Danish and the French governments have played a very leading role in helping us in the European Parliament to deliver that directive and played a very leading role in the discussions that are taking place at the UN. Uh, and uh, just for the Labour delegates who want to feel a bit better about the Labour Party after what Peter said, the Danish and the French governments are socialist governments, so it is left of centre governments that are really pushing this agenda, not just at the European, but at the international level. That Those UN guiding principles on business and human rights, some of you will work with them every day, others it will be completely new to you, but we have created an international architecture on business and human rights already. Uh, a, a wonderful, wonderful person, I'm now for his school of fame, Professor John Reggie was the architect of that in the UN system. Uh, and uh, again, we can discuss it in the discussion and questions, but essentially now, again, we're at the level of implementation. Uh, and uh, one of the things that the movement, not just in Europe, but there's something called the International Corporate Accountability Roundtable based in the States, which is all of you in the States, uh, and they are pushing this idea of national action plans so that each country is required to have implementation of those guiding principles. And what Peter was talking about in terms of the uh, Hague Cable document was Britain's contribution to that there because of this international pressure for countries to do it. And it's very, very good that Britain has to do it. Don't I put that on record in civil service even consulted me. It's probably William Hague doesn't know about it because he might have it out but never, nevertheless. But what the British plan does, it talks a lot about, when you look to, there are three pillars to the guiding principles on business and human rights. Uh, pillar two is about the principles of corporations, two, principle three is about access to justice, I'll come back to that. But pillar, pillar one is the responsibility of states themselves to enforce uh, human rights with their businesses. And it's pretty pallid what the British document says under this government. It's a lot of talk, a lot of discussion, a lot of dialogue, a lot of partnership, yeah? and very, very little binding action of any kind. There's one good bit about investment treaties, and I think it's very, very important that we hold them to that, and we hold through them to the European Union to that. But essentially, it's very a lot of talk and not very much commitment of action. And again, for people who want to feel better about this agenda, the Labour Party, I took to the National Policy Forum in July a commitment to implement the guiding principles uh, on business and human rights and carry I'm sure we'll talk about this in more detail, and her colleagues supported that, and it's in the documents that are being voted in the Labour conference this week for the manifesto for the election. So this is something that we've made good progress on. So the National Action Plan is the next one. Access to justice. There's a very brilliant lawyer called Richard Meehan, who works for Lee Day, who's the leading law firm who works for prosecutions against companies who are responsible for human rights abuse. And he came along to the annual forum on business and human rights in Geneva in December, and he made a speech that would go down well at this Labour Party conference about cuts in legal aid. Because actually the legal aid regime, which is so unpopular with all of us in Britain, is stopping the cases that he and his colleagues take to enable uh, extraterritorial prosecutions for victims who are unable to get justice within their own countries. And access to justice, or in reality barriers to access to justice, is a, a huge issue here. 
Uh, and in November, in the European Parliament, I'm hosting a conference with leading academics to try to make some steps forward in terms of that access to justice so this victims can uh, um, go through. The conflict min minerals issue, I've learned this very quickly, folks, uh, so some of it hopefully means something and we can pick it up in questions. But America has done better than Europe on conflict minerals in terms of the requirements on reporting. And many of you will know the examples of the DL Congo and the Cobalt and uh, in mobile phones and how that contributes to uh, uh, profits for people who've been responsible for human rights abuses in that country. And it's only but one example. And the European Commission, this current one that's just coming to an end, promised to bring forward legislation to match American legislation on reporting conflict minerals and has abjectly failed to do so. The Socialist Group, by the way, is, is on record as saying we absolutely support that and are pressing for it. But it's another area where we need to see uh, the action problems turned into action realised. What Peter said about ISDS, again, nobody on the streets of Manchester knows what ISDS is, but secret tribunals that corporations have access to to sue governments in, in reality to stop governments regulating them is an absolute, absolute obscenity. And I have opposed this all the way through these debates about corporate responsibility. And I understand why investors want protection and need protection. I'm not against that. But <coughs> what we have said <coughs> at every step is that if we have trade and investment agreements, there should be binding rights and protection for investors, fine. But why not binding rights and protections for workers whose his work, his work rights are abused? Why not binding rights and protection for the environment? Right? And if there was that, we'd all be in favour of it. But what we're not in favour of is secret tribunals to enable corporate interests to be able to stop governments regulating them, right? On the one hand, binding with huge amounts of compensation, and workers' rights and environmental rights simply being involuntary commitments with no mechanism for them to be enforced. And there is a case, if it's Argentina, sorry, the Argentinian friends of the audience, there, you know, there is a case to say that in some countries investors can put money in it can be swiped away and you need some legal provisions, right? Because you haven't necessarily got a functioning court system which can be used effectively in that case against strong governments, right? It's not the case in the United States and Canada, Britain and France, is it? There's court systems there and if companies feel they've been unjustly dealt with by governments, then they have ability to go to law in order to claim that. And so I think it's absolutely essential that the, the debate, which is a separate debate and movement about the, the US agreement with TTIP, and our debates about corporate responsibility are not kept separate, but together we make the point that we are against binding rights for investors that are not shared by rights for workers and for the environment too. And as Peter, I think, near the very end, but it's important to say it, right? One of the big obstacles to all of this is that people say that there's a fiduciary duty to always make the maximum profits possible uh, and that there's shareholder primacy and shareholders must always be answered before anybody else in society. And the leading academics, and again we've had seminars in the European Parliament on this and there's now a whole project taking it through, right? It's not true. Those those ideas exist there in the ether and people believe them, but they're not actually written down as part of binding company law anywhere, they're just quoted, right? And so one of the things we need to do is to revise our understanding about what the very purpose of a corporation is, and there's a brilliant uh, project at the moment that we're doing at the European level in order to, to, uh, to um, try and do that, and that will take away some of the barriers. So that's the shopping list of what we want to do in the next period. Finally, at the global level, the SDGs we've heard about. By the way, this year, I got invited to speak about this at Davos, right? which was very scary, can I just say? It was very, very scary, because it was like a James Bond film. It is at the top of a mountain, and you go out there in a tray, right? and you think there's going to be a cable car with James Bond jumping off it, and all these sorts of things. But I actually got as far as being invited to talk at Davos about this stuff. right? And what is interesting is they realise that short-termism is chronically, chronically holding back the international economy. And that's our agenda. And I didn't go to it, but the City of London, the corporation, the City of London, had a whole 
conference called Inclusive Capitalism. And I don't know some people in the audience who think capitalism is always a bad thing. But, you know, the very fact that the biggest capitalists in the world are coming and having a debate not a million miles away from the debate that we're having in this room 